welcome to a very special edition of This Week in Astrology. I almost never do this, but this episode is entirely devoted to an interview with the extraordinary astrologer and author Eric Myers, who has written a, a wonderful book, The Spiritual Dimension of the Beatles, which does not have the word astrology in the title, but boy, is there a lot of astrology in it. <laughs> so Eric, welcome to This Week in Astrology. Thank you so much, Benjamin, for having me and to reconnect. Um, We've known each other for many years now. Yeah, you used to live here in Asheville and then took off for the Northwest. And I hope you're making a wonderful life for yourself out there. I'm trying. <laughs> All of us are. Yeah. <laughs> Calendar times are in here. If we go off into a whole mundane topic, but that would probably be off, too much off topic. That'll be another interview. And this is also not the first time I've interviewed you for the, uh, the podcast. You know, we've, I think every last time you've put out your last several books, I've had a segment featuring you on the show. So interviewing you as a long and storied tradition for this podcast. You have. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Oh, my great pleasure. Okay, so this book is The Spiritual Dimension of the Beatles. And for starters, you describe yourself as a lifelong Beatles fanatic. And why do you love them so much? <laughs> well, I mean, I got into it when I was a little kid, you know, um, I was probably four or five. And back when we used to put records on turntables mm. this is the 70s <laughs> and so i rated my parents you know record album and it turned out that the beatles albums were my favorite ones so i just got into it at that very young age and it just spoke to me it just connected and now i know why all these years later uh, it's because i have a connection with them mm. and um, my my own astrology connects with them pretty strongly and it just all just clicked in, you know, immediately in this incarnation. Oh, sweet. Does your astrology connect more with the composite chart of the Beatles or is there other particular Beatles that you have a particular vibe with? Oh, you know, it, all of it. I won't get into too much of my own stuff here, but yeah, um, I've got Venus and Gemini uh, mm. as the Beatles do in their composite. So, you know, Venus is what we love. Gemini can go with that, you know, sound and variety and bouncy music and so it just kind of clicked in oh sweet now um so please give us an overview of your book the spiritual dimension of the beatles and why people might want to read it whether or not they're into astrology well you mentioned the astrology is not in the title and that's on purpose um i initially did write it as the astrology of the beatles and then I decided I need to rewrite it and create the two parts, as you see the way it's organized, because I found that what I was discovering, I thought was so significant that I didn't want to limit it to just an astrology audience. Mm. So I wrote it trying my best to be accessible to a non-astrology as well as an astrology audience. Uh, so part one is mainly astrology free, but it does have some anyway, because it was impossible not to bring in some points because they were so central to the story. Um, but I was trying to be most accessible to the widest audience. Um, so whether or not I succeeded or not remains to be seen. Hmm. Well, I hope it, it goes broad because there's, I mean, I have not read a lot of books just on the Beatles, but I learned so much about them with your book. You've clearly done your research and your bibliography, of course, has dozens of books on the Beatles. I'm sure you've done a huge amount of research as, as you put this together. Yeah, that's the way I, I tackled this is um, my own experience with the music has been there since early on, but I read a lot of books to get all the background biographical info, you know, just all of the common understandings of the story and then the astrology, of course. Yeah. So um, that was my sources. So yeah, I did read probably, I don't know, about 30, 35 Beatles books. Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay. That's a lot. Just out of curiosity, which do you have a favorite Beatles album? I don't like to play favorites, but <laughs> I will say that uh, Sergeant Pepper is uh, near and dear to my heart. And uh, I just did a talk on Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, and uh, which I believe points to astrology itself. 
And when I was a little kid, uh, the song Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite was a real favorite of mine. So Sergeant Pepper will always have a place in my heart. And then when I got a little bit older, the White Album, uh, I love the White Album <laughs> and, uh, just for so many reasons. And then I think Revolver too has, has also mm. become a favorite. So mm. the, the ones there at, at the peak in the middle period, well, I guess the White Album's a little bit later, but, um, um, and then Rubber Soul too, I love. I love them all, they're all yeah. different. Yeah. But Sweet. my first love was Sgt. Pepper. Okay, nice. Yeah, one of the things that, I mean, you were already going so deep into the sinistry by the time I was deeper into the book. I and mean, when you got to the benefit of Mr. Kite, and then you talked about the sinistry between John Lennon and the circus master of the circus whose poster he used, I said, oh my God, I, that's, well, is there nothing this man will stop at for sinistry? <laughs> <laughs> that was just amazing. There's just tons of amazing stuff. I mean, yeah, I was in a Beatles vortex for four years, you mm. know, developing and writing this. It just took over my consciousness. So I just investigated and, and there was lots I didn't keep in the book, you know. Mm. Uh, there's a lot that actually is on the cutting room floor. Yeah. Um, more tangential or secondary stuff, but I I just geeked out and and investigated anything. Mm. Well, I can imagine if this book takes off, there could be a follow-up later. The the spiritual dimension of the Beatles, the B sides. <laughs> you could well, I thought years. about doing a book <laughs> called Beyond the Beatles, which is after the breakup, mm. and looking at their solo careers and their lives as individuals after the breakup. Whoa! But I'm leaning against doing that because it's not the same magic and mystique as the Beatles. And in fact, a lot of what happens afterwards is not as bright. You know, there's yeah, some dark yeah. things and I don't know if I want to do that, but it's an idea. Mm, well, for the future consideration then. Maybe. Okay. So the bio on the back of your book says, quote, Eric is an astrological counselor, teacher, and author living outside Portland, Oregon. He holds an MA in Transpersonal Counseling Psychology from Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado, a lifelong Beatles fanatic. This book is the synthesis of his two greatest passions, music and astrology. The Spiritual Dimension of the Beatles is his seventh book. Now that's admirably concise, but in my opinion, it doesn't do you justice. Is there anything else that would help people to know about you as we get deeper into this discussion? Well, it's concise because it's a little thumbnail on the back of the cover. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I studied with Stephen Forrest. I, um, Got my master's at Naropa in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I was in the mental health field for many years. Um, yeah, and then I've been doing astrology counseling for 20 years now, since I graduated mm. Naropa in 2001, um, 20 years ago, and I love it. It's what I do, it's my primary job. Being an author has always been secondary being a counselor is my bread and butter. That's my primary focus. Mm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, seven books for a side job is pretty prolific. Well done. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Now you mentioned already the two part structure of the book and um, you alluded to it, but just to be clear, um, I'll, I'll describe it for, if you want to describe the structure, you can, or, or I can describe it. Go again. ahead. You can do it. Yeah. So basically you can read part one solo without ever looking at part two and still get a great read and still a very satisfying experience. But there's these special little footnotes frequently throughout part one that direct you back to the relevant page in part two, where here is the astrological underpinnings of what he just talked about. And uh, for someone who isn't into astrology, that's not essential, but for someone like me, I read every single footnote and I, I, it went so deep and, and was so juicy. So um, that allows non-astrologers to appreciate the book in the first section, and those who want to learn more can dive into part two. So I assume that's why you broke it up into two parts, like you said, to accommodate both types of readers. You just described it perfectly, and, um, and I'm glad to hear this because um, it sounds like it may have worked, at least in your situation. Yeah, plus um, it gave me some exercise, you know, <clears throat> reading a book is very passive and I got to get some you know calories burned as I went back and forth between the pages. <laughs> I felt, felt there's no other way to do it because if I included 
all the astrology in part one, it probably would have turned off the non-astrologer mm. for too much that they have to go around. So I put it in its own section in part two. So okay. you know, as I say, get a bookmark and flip back and forth. I mean, there's no other way to do it. Yeah, I used Q-tips, but it did the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right, thanks. Um, so you've used... My, my recollection is when you were living here in Asheville, you were already using the four asteroid goddesses, Athena, Ceres, Juno, and Vesta in your charts routinely. Sure. Okay. But in this book, you added, is it pronounced Euterpe? Or how do you pronounce that? I think it's called Euterp. Euterp. Okay. It's spelled E-U-T-R-P-E in any event. So, and she's one of the Greek muses associated with music. Now, I know you talk about it in the book, but some of these questions are for the benefit of the listener more than me. So why did you include her and why her and not any of the other muses, some of whom are also associated with music? That seemed like the, the most central one. When I did my research, I found muses for poetry, for dance, for comedy, for music. This one was the one for music. Um, I did research on it. It was just the most compelling and clear um, relevance. I mean, it really brought everything together. And I will say that I discovered this late in the process. I wrote the book without bringing in um, this asteroid uh, hmm. that correlates with the muse. Um, and then I rewrote the book uh, to incorporate it. And the research, like particularly for yesterday, um, where it just was so striking and that eclipse that happened in 1965 that correlates with yesterday. And mm. I believe McCartney connecting with the muse, his, his dead mother. Right. It was just so striking. I mean, the astrology could not be more precise. I mean, <laughs> uh, it was ridiculous um, to have um, that signature, you turp the muse. Um, so what I'm talking about for the listener is um, there was this eclipse in May, end of May, 1965, um, in Gemini that I call the big Gemini eclipse. And it is conjunct that asteroid, the muse, Euterp, and Mary McCartney, uh, her own chart, you know, her North Node, uh, nine degrees, uh, Gemini conjunct Juno, romantic songwriting. And her nodal axis has Euterp involved as well. Um, it all just was so perfectly being hit off. It was obvious that this was um, relevant and brought the whole project to literally another dimension. Mm. So I think I was fortunate to not discover it until late in the process. And then I was able to write the, the whole book and then bring it in, uh, kind of overlaying it. Um, so it wasn't my hypothesis. It wasn't really the direction that the book was going is just what I discovered. So how I discovered it is I just did an internet search around, okay, how are you going to locate the muse? Because that's a big issue in Beatles, you know, biography and what I'm seeing. How do I locate the muse? And then I just said, oh, you turp. Okay. Hmm, I'll check that out. Yeah. When I did a, a research on, on the Greek muses, there were actually several who were involved with music. And and the, the at least the side I got to said your trip was lyric music specifically. Yeah, well, that's what we're looking at here. Lyrics is yeah. Well, yeah. contribution to lyrics, but also I believe, you know, inspiration with music as well. Mm -hmm. um, but there is you know this idea of uh, co-creation uh, is I believe what was happening here. Yeah, for sure. And that was my next question. Actually, you you hypothesize not only that Mary McCartney after her death was a muse to Paul, but that Julia Lennon, John's mother, who had also died when he was young, was his muse on many songs. Sure, and, yeah, um, they paralleled each other every step of the way. Hmm. And, and you also make a theme that much of their songwriting is about loss and a lot of the romantic songs are sort of disguising their longing for their dead mothers. And they're projecting that onto the desire for the romantic partner. I believe so. Yeah. Um, in 1963, when their music was becoming more, uh, proliferating more, um, 
and a lot of famous songs in 63. She Loves You, I Want to Hold Your Hand, the first album. Um, most of 1963, you had Juno conjunct Ceres. And I talk about the trans, uh, the transference of romance, Juno, um, around the mother, Ceres, was mm. literally going on. Um, and many other pieces of astrological evidence. So every conclusion that I made in the book is based on the astrology. I didn't come up with my own stuff. It isn't, it isn't me um, saying, oh, this is an hypothesis. The book is, here's what the astrology is suggesting mm. to the best of my ability to interpret it. And so, so that seemed obvious that there was a transference with maternal stuff with romance. So if I hear you correctly, you didn't come in with it. Oh, they were act acting with their mothers as their muses. The astrology showed up and that's what actually gave you the idea. I didn't even happening. think about that until the writing was more complete. Because yeah. in the literature, the mothers are only mentioned very briefly. Mm. Um, they died. Okay. It was sad. They were teenagers. Then, you know, that was in the 50s. Um, that's kind of the preamble. And then most of Beatles literature picks up, of course, in the 60s when they were making music. So right. the deaths were in the 50s. It's, it's not really discussed too much outside of that. Mm. And so, again, I went into this project without any preconceived notions, total beginner's mind. I'm just going to see where it goes. Wow. So what turned into the dominant focus emerged late in the process. Fascinating. Yeah, to me, I was saying, well, that's a very interesting hypothesis. And and you're so careful in your writing, a hypothesis is that <laughs> the muse thing is going on. And then, but when you got to discussing let it be, it's like, oh my God, that nails it. You know, Mother Mary comes to me speaking words of wisdom. I mean, that's just so blatant, you know? You know, <laughs> McCartney really, uh, really concludes it well. Um, the, what, what he does with Let It Be is the perfect thing. I, I mean, um, I, I feel like he should get credit um, or something to making this story, the way that I'm presenting it, tied up in a bow so nicely with that song. Mm. Um, it's just so perfect um, as a grand finale. And I love that song. And it really is, um, as you mentioned, it's what ties it all together is let it be the, mm. the song. It's an amazing accomplishment. I love that mm. song. Yeah. Um, now we've been talking about the asteroid goddesses some, and I've heard different opinions about using asteroid goddesses. Um, some astrologers feel like they they deserve just as full blown a treatment as if it was the moon or Venus and others feel like, well, unless it's powerfully aligned with other, you know, more traditional planets, you shouldn't give it too much weight. What is your feeling about the use of Ceres, Vesta, Juno, and Pallas as standalone things, or do they need aspect support before you'll take them seriously? Um, to me, there are only four of many potential asteroids. There's hundreds and thousands that you can use. Um, supporting information that's more specific. Um, so the major players in astrology are always valid and um, we could always use those. It's just to get some additional supporting information. You know, for instance, Venus, uh, Libra, you've got relationship stuff going on with that. But Juno brings in a little bit more focus on, on purely romantic um, dynamics. Um, Ceres has overlap with the moon and Cancer, but it's more specific about the mother in my view, whereas cancer and, um, and the moon is more about our roots and family and broader issues of love uh, and inheritance uh, from the family mythology. Um, so Sarah's just gets you a bit more focus on nourishment and attachment issues, uh, particularly with the mother. So it's just refines your investigation a little bit, but um, many others are also potentially relevant. You can't bring in everything. Um, I have found that the, those four major ones, in my experience, um, have been uh, valid and resonant. So I bring them in, and they are instructive and they were helpful in this project. Yeah, all, yeah. All four of them. 
I don't know if you started using because of the influence of Kelly Lee Phipps like I did, but um, not but, as much as Kelly, but um, just Demetra George's book Asteroid Goddesses uh, has was a big one for me. Yeah, and just ast astrology discourse, you know, the way people are discussing Chiron is also in the book, and and that's of course you know widely used. Um, and I see you know these asteroids being uh, part of the public discourse. I, I don't think using them is in any way trailblazing. It's pretty standard to me. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. You know, I, I think they cover meanings that you just don't get through the other bodies and they're helpful meanings. So I've, mm -hmm. I've made them standard in my work for years as well. Um, one of the most magical things you describe in the Beatles composite chart is what you call the Beatles signature. So tell us about that and how you feel like it colors their overall vibe. Yeah, well, I, uh, I mentioned that earlier. Um, yeah, the Beatles have a Venus-Jupiter conjunction in Gemini in their composite chart. And they have a Sag ascendant and a Libra midheaven. And so that Jupiter-Venus conjunction rules both the angles. It's also right on the descendant. It's angular itself. Mm. And, um, and it just captures their big cultural impact. You know, Jupiter's expansive Venus popularity in Gemini, a message, um, but also the variety. You know, the Beatles have incredible variety. I mean, they started out as with basically no variety, just love songs in what I call the early formula. Mm -hmm. And a lot of their early songs sound similar. And then <laughs> they grow and mature. At this, I mentioned the White Album before. Yeah. Uh, the White Album has more variety than possibly any other rock or pop album that's ever been produced. Uh, it's multiple genres, um, you know, everything from Revolution 9, you know, which is avant garde, you know, to folk to heavy metal with Helter Skelter. Uh, to kind of 60s kind of rock to retro pieces, you know, evoking another era. Mm. Um, the Beatles were all over the place with their variety. Now, McCartney was a Gemini, and he gets a lot of this credit, actually, um, for the variety of Beatles music, in, in my view. Um, and so the Beatles signature captures their buoyant, infectious, lively, um, you know, invitation for uh, charm and, and fun and um, play with that signature. It's, it's very bouncy mm. um, and, and very engaging. Um, and so I think it's the dominant part of their composite chart. Yeah. Do you, um, do you put any significance on the fact that Venus and Jupiter are also the two ancient benefics? You know, as you probably saw in the book, I don't look at things with a good, bad uh, lens in anything in astrology. I don't bring in judgments of things being good or bad. Benefic is a good reference. Uh, to me, it's the consciousness that interacts with the astrology that's going to influence how it qualitatively plays out, not the energy itself. So I don't uh, focus on good, bad distinctions. Okay. And it just seemed like a bonus to me. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I came away from your book feeling like I had indirectly received a master class in astrology. You use natal interpretations, transits, secondary progressions, two-person synastry, group synastry, and mundane astrology, and maybe other things I didn't even list here. But how much astrological education would a reader need before they are ready for part two of your book? Well, I mean, everyone comes in with their own background. You know, I try to make it accessible to a wide audience. The more people study, the more informed they're going to be, and the more they're going to be able to get more nuance and detail. Um, but it can be part of the process. It can be a good learning tool um, to complement other books. It's not designed to be an intro astrology book. Um, I didn't want to take that on. It's not the focus here. There's mm. plenty else out there that are intro books. So um, I don't have too much else to say. I mean, it's it's there 
written at the level it's written at and people will interact with it how they will. Um, again, I try to be as accessible as I can um, to a non-astrological audience. And I also wanted it to get deep and nerdy for people like you and me that will appreciate um, you know, the depth that astrology can reveal mm. um, when we get into it deeply. I wanna make one more point on the prior question okay. um, about your benefic thing. Just to finish that, um, I think Jupiter and Venus in that combination can have a very problematic regressive dark side, which the Beatles actually played out. Um, mm. Their hedonism, their excessive drug use, their, um, you know, at the beginning of their career, uh, Jupiter, Venus, and Gemini could be superficial and just overly in that bouncy, it may lack depth. Um, but there is a shadow to everything mm. in astrology. And so uh, Jupiter, Venus isn't purely, you know, positive. It has a dark side that can be very destructive and even harmful. Mm. Um, overindulgence is nothing to celebrate. Mm. And they did that. And um, even the bigness of their popularity, Jupiter, Venus became hazardous. It became dangerous and probably responsible for even death uh, mm. after uh, and stabbing. So th mm. I don't view th anything as inherently good or bad. So mm. I wanted to finish that. Okay, it's one of the reasons why I'm I'm on the fringe <laughs> of, <laughs> of, of astrology because it's such a part of the tradition. But to yeah. me, it's consciousness, not not uh, symbols that indicate um, the quality of how things are going to manifest. Yeah, I'm I'm of the same view, but I, I couldn't help noticing that, so I wanted to check your opinion on the the double benefic thing from the ancient viewpoint. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, before I ask this next question, I just want to, because people could be hearing this years from now. Uh, it is, as we record this, December 6, 2021. And Get Back, the doc, the Beatles documentary by Peter Jackson, recently started streaming on Disney+. Plus. You even mentioned it briefly in your book. What do you think of Get Back? And did you time your book's publication to roughly coincide with the release of the documentary? I started writing this book in 2016. And the Get Back movie was not on anyone's mind. I, my writing of this book has absolutely nothing to do with that movie at all. Uh, when I was finishing the book, um, just being aware with an antenna into news and the collective consciousness, that that was a thing that was gonna come out. So when I was editing the relevant chapter that was about those sessions, I mentioned it, mm. that uh, that is um, you know, another depiction of, of this time that might be of interest to the reader. Um, but my book has nothing to do with that movie whatsoever. And, and you have Beatles stuff that comes out every year. There's books or other things or courses. And so having this book come out around the same time as something else, that would happen any year. Mm. Um, so it's, they're completely independent. Okay, just a happy accident then. Okay. And it's not even an accident. It's just there's tons of Beatles stuff that continually comes out. Yeah. Um, so this is just another one. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. Okay. Now, my Google search showed no other books on the astrology of the Beatles. So congratulations for breaking ground on that. And only one other significant book on the astrology of music called The Book of Music Horoscopes, which is a multi author essay collection edited by Frank Clifford that was published in 2018. Did you read that book and did it inform or inspire your Beatles book in any way? I haven't read that book. Uh, Frank actually invited me to be part of that a couple of years ago, but I was so immersed in the heart of writing the, the book we're talking about mm. that I, um, at that time, was not um, doing other things. I just kind of went into cave mode Mm. And, you know, I was in the Beatles vortex and I just wanted to do the research and write the, the, the book as, as you have come to, to see it. Mm. So I am aware of what Frank did and, um, and I hope there's more. I think there's, uh, you can apply astrology to anything um, and applying it to arts and music and to understand biographies of people or what have you. Um, I'd love to see that more and more. So mm. I applaud any efforts along those lines. Yeah. In fact, I did a little search more broadly and discovered a book came out, I think just this year, someone looked at the astrological similarities between actors and the famous real people they played. 
Yeah. I don't, it's a mirror mirror, I think it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Alex Trenoworth. Yeah. Uh, just published that book. Um, yeah. Another great innovative, you know, uh, exploration through astrology. I mean, you can apply it to anything. Yeah. Do you know of any other books that dive deep into the astrology of a popular band or musician? Um, On the level that like you've done with the Beatles here? Not that I know of. I, there's been plenty of articles, you know, yeah. like you'll find in magazines or on, on the internet somewhere, but I don't know of too many full-scale books of this scope. Yeah, I couldn't I've find any, here. at least not searching Amazon, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I might do another one, but the problem is, is getting the exact birth info. Mm. I'm just lucky to have that for the Beatles, but um, I wouldn't have that for a few of the other real famous bands that I would have interest in doing. I don't have complete birth info, so I'm not gonna mm. do it. Yeah. And, and of course, you could also always rectify, but you know that's always a gamble, I guess. No, I'm not yeah. doing that. That's okay. Not... Yeah, you don't want to gamble gears on on that, right? <laughs> no, okay. that's not an exact science, anyway. Yeah, true. Okay, so um, you work a lot with the composite chart of the Beatles as well as transits to it, and, I, and that is a midpoint composite chart, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, now again, this kind of struck me because my training had been that you can't run transits to a composite chart. You'd have to do a Davison chart for that. And I think you can do a Davison chart for three or more people. I don't, what, I don't see why you can't. My book has plenty of, of transits to their composite chart. And they also do work. Book. So your view well, is that there's no problem running transits to a, com to yeah, a composite chart. I've never heard of that. I don't agree with that. And my experience is, is anything but that. No, the transits to their composite chart are are is the dominant part of the unfolding of their story yeah so and I don't, uh, I don't see any problem with that yeah and i was holding that tension in my own mind with that belief i'd held that you can't run transits to a composite and yet it's working and working and working so i've never heard that and i've been working with composite charts for 20 years so oh, wow this is, okay so your 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 mention of this is completely new to me i don't have any issue or seen any difficulty with it whatsoever Okay. All right. Well, I may have to revise that belief because it would appear to be out improper. So thanks for correcting me. In fact, I work with couples all the time. Just even yesterday is what I was doing is looking at the transits to um, a couple's composite chart. I mean, I work with this, you know, all the time. Um, okay. Yeah. No, I have no issue there. Yeah. It's good for my humility. There's always more for me to learn, you know, because astrology is a bottom as well. Okay, you described the astrological arc of awakening that happened during the 60s and how the music of the Beatles aligned with it. Tell us about the arc and awake of awakening and how the Beatles work kind of were influenced by that. Yeah. Um, so the, the dominant astrology in the 1960s was the Uranus Pluto conjunction, which peaked in 65, 66. And so I had the insight um, when I was um, writing the book, that the Beatles story really is this rising peak and falling. And then it occurred to me that if you look at the degree of closeness between Uranus and Pluto, you know, using a 10 degree orb, it gets tighter as it rises. And then when it separates and it loosens, would be the downward motion. Mm -hmm. And once I saw that, if you map that out, it portrays the Beatles rise and fall, coinciding with Uranus and Pluto. So as you saw throughout the book, at the beginning of each chapter, there's a little bubble saying, this is where we are in that motion. So it's a bell curve. Mm. And so in 1961 is when it is when it enters a 10 degree orb and they meet Brian Epstein right at the right when it lifts off. And then, and it separates from 10 degrees in uh, spring of 1970, right when the announcement of a breakup hits the public. Mm -hmm. So it's a nine year event that coincides with discovery of from Epstein to the breakup with their you know, great works at the peak in the middle years of the 60s. It just was so, you know, reflective and, you know, clear. So that became the centerpiece of the book to track where we are, mm -hmm. is where are we 
1964 or 1968 or whatever in the Uranus Pluto as the backdrop, as the major astrology of that decade. And for those who may not know, Brian Epstein, of course, was the Beatles manager. Yeah. Yeah. Because not everyone is as well versed. <laughs> so um, you also made a point in the book about how the nature of their music changed dramatically depending on which part of the arc they were on. You want yeah, to I break it down into four different phases um, in their trajectory. Um, what I call the personality expression phase, which is with all those songs were pronouns, I, I, me, me, you, you. And it's very childlike actually in the personality expression phase. And then personality reconciliation, um, which is further development and getting a little bit more um, nuanced, a little bit more sophisticated, still about the personality, but it's about humility. It's about maturation. And then the transcendence phase begins in 1966 with Revolver at the peak. And that begins their um, call what you will. They're more, they're more out there. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's at the peak and it's the transcendence phase. And this is where the lofty inspired multidimensional music is. And then the individuation phase is from the White Album through the end which is coming back down to ground, back to their own individuation. And then that led to the eventual breakup, which is really about individuation from the all encompassing myth of the Beatles. So what's most amazing about it is that all of this plays out in only seven to eight years. They go through four distinct stages of spiritual maturation compacted into a very short time frame, mm. which I believe is just illustrating for us what we might go through in the entire lifetime, mm, wow. which is pretty remarkable. Yeah. Because the growth that happened, you know, was rapid and profound. I mean, as I mentioned in the book, Hard Day's Night came out in summer of 1964. Revolver, or the song Tomorrow Never Knows, was recorded in April of 66, less than two years later. Mm. And the consciousness that is that you can see between the difference between Hard Day's Night, which is personality expression phase, which is adore me, love me, make me feel okay, mm -hmm. to Tomorrow Never Knows, which is a striking metaphysical vision of the cosmos about reincarnation and consciousness and soul connection. That only happens in less than two years, mm. which is phenomenal. Yeah. And I believe because the Uranus Pluto was peaking and they were connected in mm -hmm. with other dimensions, that's what the book's about. And that's what I illustrate astrologically. Wow, thank you, beautiful answer. Um, you are a very prolific author. Again, I know books are only your sideline, but this is your seventh book. Um, what are the most important concepts from your prior work that underpinned the Beatles book? Well, I don't know if it's so much underpinning the Beatles book. It's just, I've developed my own um, approach that I've written about the astrology of awakening approach. And, you know, it's just really looking at things in terms of the evolution of consciousness and away from, you know, a lot of simplistic good, bad stuff that we talked about before and looking at things as a process of developing consciousness or awareness. And so, the acorn that gradually grows into the tree is not a unique analogy to my work, but it's one that I bring in. And I look at that, you know, astrologically. I look at the moon as the seed, the nodal axis of the moon as the gardening and the sun as the potential flowering. That's a big part of my approach. And that's seen throughout the Beatles book. That's the way I look at charts. That's the way I I counsel and there's many other things too, but that's the core mm. of it. Um, so it's just my my own approach that I've been developing and refining for 20 years. Wow. Thank you, great answer. Um, you give astrology charts for many of the Beatles songs based on when the recording session for each song began. Do you find significant synchronicity between the chart for the song itself and the transits to the songwriter's chart? 
Yeah, well, I talk about that in the book too. Um, I think there's a section um, that here's the um, astrology for Beatlemania. Here's all the major transits and progressions that each one was going through. So yeah, it's all interconnected. It's it's all you know fleshed out with a lot of detail in the book. So sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I came across when I was um, doing a little web search related to this interview. Um, according to the following web page, dangerousminds.net slash comment slash the little known story of the Beatles on staff astrologer, Caleb Ashburton Dunning was hired not only as the assistant manager of the Beatles Apple boutique in London, but as the house astrologer to do daily horoscopes for the Beatles when asked and charts for any special event or problem. This post says that Ashburton Dunning did the majority of his astrological work for John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Your book clearly describes the synchronicity between the Beatles, their work, and the numerous astrological factors you described. Do you think John or any of the other Beatles were consciously working with the astrological factors you describe? No, um, not at all. Um, I didn't read what you just uh, mentioned. I didn't come across that. Um, I did come across um, article that uh, informed me that they did have an in-house astrologer in the Apple location, and that's 1968, um, which is right, uh, you know, towards the end of mm -hmm. the story. Um, and so, from my understanding, um, you know, their experience with astrology was limited um, and, you know, there, there is an in-house astrologer at the Apple location, but I, I don't have a sense in, again, reading 30 to 40 books that they had any significant relationship with the astrologer. Um, they were incredibly busy mm. doing what they were doing. You know, George was the most interested in metaphysical pursuits. Uh, eventually he had his own astrology chart rectified because he was unsure if it was accurate. Um, but there's no evidence to suggest they were consciously working with astrology now. Um, in fact, my sense is that um, they weren't really even that into it or open to it outside of George, um, who might have developed his interest later. Mm. Um, but there's certainly nothing in the literature that even points to any type of involvement at all i don't see that it's not there in 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 the literature okay okay thank you um now john was the clear leader of the beatles for the first several albums he initially formed the band but then around the time of sergeant pepper apparently paul took over and he was the de facto leader for the rest of their time what what were the key astrological factors that led to that switch over of leadership yeah um i addressed that at length in the sergeant pepper um, chapters uh, with the leadership change um, that was going on there. Um, and it has roots to their own soul lessons. You know, John had a unfinished desire to be a leader and he was the leader, but he was also developing the ability as a Libra with a Libra North node in the sixth house to defer, to collaborate, to be less individualistically driven. McCartney was more diplomatic. His sixth house south node was more deferential, more willing to support another. And his development with his Pluto Mars conjunction in Leo was to emerge with more creative leadership and power. And so they, in my view, as I discuss, their sole contract was to support each other in this way. Um, I One of my favorite lines I wrote in the book is that John Lennon was a visionary learning how to be a performer, and McCartney was a performer learning how to be a visionary. Hmm. You could also say that Lennon was a leader learning how to collaborate, and McCartney was a collaborator learning how to be a leader. Hmm. And so the leadership change happened more or less in the middle, and uh, Lennon in the first half, McCartney in the second half that was the intention that was supportive for both of them to learn the lessons they needed to learn and it did play out in that way and it was appropriate i believe for paul 
to exercise greater leadership in the second half and for John to learn how to defer a bit more. Now, weren't there some key transits to Paul's chart around that time that really, really stimulated that leadership vibe? Yeah, Jupiter was in Leo when this happened and hit his Mars Pluto conjunction in Leo. Mm. And he was amping up in his progress moon, got to Leo and was hitting, I call it in, in the book, his Pluto Mars conjunction in Leo, the I'm in charge signature. <laughs> uh, because it was buried Pluto and he wasn't in charge and he had angst and resentment because he wanted to be more of a leader. And then that ripened mm. that signature in his chart uh, by his progress moon and transiting Jupiter was lighting it up and he became uh, much more of the leader from Sergeant Pepper and onwards. As I mentioned in the book, he was the principal creative visionary for the Magical Mystery Tour. He had the most work that appeared on, on Abbey Road. He wrote the grand finale of Let It Be for the Let It Be album. Mm. And he had many monster number one hits, including Hey Jude in the second half. He was far more successful and prolific as a songwriter than John was in the second half. Mm. Um, and then John was, you know, putting his focus into other things, including Yoko and getting divorced and falling in love and doing much more experimental avant-garde music. Um, so he, he kind of did his job. He got him to the peak, mm. you know? And I talk about in the first half, you know, it really was Lennon in the first half of the story that drove him up the hill of the ark mm. and put him on, the, on his back. And he was not only the dominant songwriter, but inspirational figure and leader. And, you know, Lennon brought them through his will and his determination into the success they had. Absolutely, mm. that was Lennon. And then McCartney was more dominant in the second half. Yeah, I remember the phrase you used repeatedly. I think it was Lennon's phrase. He wanted to be at the toppermost of the poppermost, right? Yeah, that was his rallying call. And that yeah. is, there's all these vertical references, the toppermost. So you can look at the arc with a vertical dimension. And then when they got to the toppermost, Lennon more or less fill, fulfilled his karmic thing, you know, his, his intention. He had less urgency and motivation in the second half because he brought him to the top of most. Mm, cool. And then there's George Harrison, yeah. um, who was quite a bit younger than the others. So he naturally was playing a more junior role, even though he was the lead guitarist, but his songwriting, as you know, really blossomed in the later albums and he became where his songs were really comparable to the quality of the Lennon McCartney stuff. Do you, what, what do you describe astrologically that really showed that coming forward? Well, Harrison wasn't that much younger. I mean, he was born February of 43. McCartney was born in June of 42. So he's only what, about nine months younger than McCartney. Okay, That's so that. I missed that. Not that heard significant, that. but he was the youngest Beatle. Um, you know, George the Pisces, but the dominant thing about him is the ninth house Jupiter. George was the teacher, the philosopher. George was more learned around um, Eastern philosophy. And George brought in much more of a mature message than John or Paul ever did. And, you know, he gets a lot of ink in this book and rightfully so, because it's the spiritual dimension of the Beatles. So, you know, George's contribution for this particular project is very central. And a lot of what he did is seen as secondary, but in this project, I believe it's primary. I mean, songs like The Inner Light or Within You, Without You, or Love You Too, um, and others, uh, song It's All Too Much, that was on Yellow Submarine. Mm. These are songs that had very important message and philosophy that sculpted the Beatles' message. Mm. Uh, George was the philosopher slash teacher and his contribution, especially from the spiritual perspective is absolutely bedrock and essential. And one of the lines that I have come to say is there is no Beatles without George Harrison. Mm. I mean, he is, is looked at as secondary to John and Paul, but from my analysis and for what his contribution in this topic, <laughs> He's as central and necessary and primary as the two so-called leaders. 
So there's ample discussion of George in the book and rightfully so with this topic. And which leads us with Ringo, who, you know, being the drummer would not get as much press, but you point out with all of, I believe he has the cancer son and he's like the one really wanting to hold together as a family and acting as this foundational unifying force. Do you want to talk a little bit about how Ringo was also so central once they finally got the drummer right, how that really- Yeah, well, worked. that's his contribution is he's the emotional anchor of the whole thing. And he was the counterbalance to the other three who were much more wanting to take um, leadership with, with songwriting and musical direction. So uh, Ringo was incredibly essential um, for that. And then he too developed right at the end of the Beatles. Um, he started to write more. And then Ringo had the second most prolific, you know, solo career. Um, hmm. Ringo has 18 solo albums. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's not John and George's fault that they passed away, but history will record that Ringo has the second most prolific solo career to, to Paul. Hmm. Uh, so he was influenced and he actually did at the end. Uh, the song Don't Pass Me By on the White Album. Um, and then Octopus's Garden on Abbey Road. Um, he, he wrote songs in a similar vein as his bandmates with spiritual significance, just like them. Uh, but his, his end of the deal was he was going to be a source of security and foundation. He was the anchor. Mm. But here's the thing about Ringo, I'll say real quick, is that if you look at Ringo's um, contribution, not only with what he wrote, but if you include the songs that he sung, mm -hmm. that he didn't write, but he sung, you've got about you know 11 or 12 songs in the entire catalog, and you put those 11 or 12 songs on an album, that's a pretty damn good album. <laughs> True. And so Ringo uh, would create just on his own to sing or write a whole album of Beatles music that is probably a lot better um, than most other rock albums that have ever been created. And so Ringo's contribution is significant. I do think with a little help from my friends is an iconic song that defined, or even the Wonder Years feature that and Joe Cocker's famous cover. Mm -hmm. um, and then Yellow Submarine is an iconic song. Yeah. And number one hit that Ringo sang. Mm -hmm. So he is there and he sings backup vocals on a lot of the later stuff. You can hear him pretty prominently on Abbey Road and even on Sgt. Pepper as a mm. backup singer. Um, so he's there. Um, he just didn't do, you know, the lion's share of the original writing. So he's represented less so in this book because he just didn't create a body of work as big. Mm. Okay, thank you. So obviously you read 30 or 40 books to research this. If if someone was really inspired by your book to go deeper into the Beatles, um, is there one of those books that you think would be like the the one to read if you really wanted to get a thorough? Uh, yeah, well, career? you know, Mark Lewison is the main Beatle historian and author and expert, and anything by Lewison is going to be necessary to read. Um, I did enjoy the Ian McDonald book, Revolution in the Head. That was helpful. Um, and many others were more secondary um, in this process. Um, I'm not, I don't have a view of my bookcase from where I'm sitting to mention more, um, but, uh, you know, start with those. Um, and then in those books, you'll see plenty in the bibliography as well. I mean, there's a lot out there. Yeah. Um, so I know your book is a physical book right now. Any intention or idea that it might become an ebook or an audio book at some point? I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't think it translates to that. And I am self-published and I'm not willing to put the thousands of hours into making uh, an ebook or audio book. Um, you know, if this project um, does have a different iteration, if it does um, it somehow um, get more conventional publishing, then that's something a publishing house could do. But I don't have the time or resources or interest 
I'm not a business type. I'm not a, you know, the, the real challenge for me, to be honest, I don't have a lot of earth in my chart. I'm a astrologer, thinker, philosopher kind of type. I'm, I'm not interested or really have the skills to do a lot of business and marketing and transformation into other uh, iterations like you're suggesting. That's mm -hmm. not who I am and what my interest is. Okay. Um, if you can lend me some of your Capricorn, Benjamin, <laughs> I would be able to do that. But I don't have any planets in Capricorn and really not too much in the other Earth signs either. So I come up with the material. If other people want to do something like that, <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> okay, thank you. So that's all the questions I had prepared. Um, do you have any last thoughts you wanted to share before we wrap this thing up? Oh, um, no. Uh, yeah, I thought we were going to talk a little bit longer, but we can cut it here if you want. Um, well, no, but I, you know, I, I left anywhere from one to two hours for the interview, but I don't want to milk it out longer than it wants to go. But anything um, you want to add now, we totally have time and space for. Okay. Um, gosh. Yeah, one thing I will mention, um, one of my favorite parts of this book that um, is the threads. We haven't mentioned that. Oh, that's true. Is we talked about the arc of awakening. That is the overarching context, but the threads are what we follow uh, throughout the entire book. And there's five major threads and five minor threads that run through the story that all have to do with the spirituality of the process. And at the end of the book, um, well, I had help with this with my friend Bill Street um, doing the graphics, is there's actually graphics that illustrate how the different threads took form um, hmm. in the story, um, which is fascinating. One of my favorite parts is the extras where you can look um, at each of the threads um, and within the song catalog and commentary on how they developed and their significance. Um, so I don't know if you want to, or if we have time to go into more detail on those oh, yeah. threads. Why don't you but, tell us what the major threads are and, and elaborate a little bit on them? Okay, so the five major threads is you have the solar thread, the dream thread, what I call the call thread, the dark thread, and the death thread are the five major threads. So the solar thread is about the sun and it's pretty absent early on. They're not talking about the sun, they're in darkness at the beginning and then it gradually develops and flourishes. And by the end of the um, trajectory, you look at Abbey Road, you've got songs that are specifically about the sun. Here comes the sun, mm -hmm. sun king. <laughs> and so the sun, and in my view, about awakening, about illumination, portrays their own process of awakening and then specifically writing about the sun. It's, it's perhaps the dominant thread. Hmm with the dream thread being equally as important in interweaving. So the dream thread goes more with the moon, our subjectivity, the way we project out our own impressions, our own consciousness, our own emotional disposition onto all of life. And so many of their songs are about the recognition of our own dreamlike nature. For instance, Strawberry Fields is all about that. If you mm. read the lyrics, it's recognizing that the past was a dream. Mm. Eleanor Rigby lives in a dream that's at the peak. So at the peak and those in the transcendence period is the recognition of the dreamlike nature of reality because the solar thread is also developing to interweave with the dream thread. So this is all about spiritual awakening, mm. that we are in the theater of our own soul work. And this is my own work, as I described, and the way I work with clients and write about it, perfectly dovetails with this trajectory and this process that I see in Beatles, 
um, lyrics and music. And so when I discovered that, I became even more um, dedicated and personally involved because I found a similarity with my own um, astrology and my own philosophy and spirituality as seen in their song catalog. So as I mentioned, my own Venus and Gemini on the Beatles, I was like, oh, I have concordance here mm. with, with the Gemini, with the ideas, with the message that is going on in the lyrics. Um, then the death thread is fascinating. You know, when we think of the Beatles, we normally don't think of death. It's generally people think of upbeat, infectious music. You don't really think of death or funerals or, but to my great surprise and illustrated throughout the book, there's 30 death songs that mention the word or derivative of the word dead or death in the lyrics. And this is what John and Paul were awakening and resolving in their own process as seen in that trajectory was death and death songs peak on Revolver, which I actually call the death album. Hmm. It has the most, most death songs and that's at 1966 at the peak. And so another major theme of the book is awakening to the reality of what death really is, which is not a morbid final ending, but a transformation. Uranus hmm. Pluto, having a metaphysical Uranus perspective of Pluto of death is a major theme. And then not only do people not die, but we can actually connect with dead people and maybe even collaborate with them is what the book research revealed to mm. my great mm. delight and astonishment. So the death thread is really important. Then the dark thread is kind of, you know, the antithesis thread darkness going with unconsciousness, going with um, not being in the light of awareness. And so seeing how dark songs interact in contrast to the solar songs is pretty fascinating as well. And mm -hmm. then the call thread is um, another fascinating part of it. And this is all about the pleas for reunion. Um, which the call thread is most dominant in the personality expression phase, the first three albums, where they're calling out for connection and love and security and um, because they lost their mothers and they're basically playing out more childlike or adolescent themes and consciousness. And then the call is answered and calls start coming in. I just did this talk on losing the sky with diamonds and somebody calls you, you answer quite slowly. And then across the universe, uh, being called on and on across the universe. And so the call thread completely transforms because something is calling them from mm -hmm. beyond the veil. And there's numerous call songs that show that transformation of calling out, rising up, being able to be called and then collaborating with the sources of the lost love. So really to my surprise, and, and I'm, as I was saying, the most heartwarming part of this, I mean, it's fascinating, mind blowing astrology, but what it comes down to is that this is an epic love story. It's not a conventional one. It's not a boy girl romantic love, love story but it's a spiritual love story of reun reuniting with the lost soulful love. And so Let It Be captures that. Mother Mary comes to me speaking words to wisdom, words of wisdom, channeling this wisdom from the other side of the veil. Mm -hmm. And I wake up to the sound of music. And it's all about this beautiful reunion with the sacred love. So again, not a romantic love, but a deep soulful love where we have a connection at a soul level, in my view, for many, many lifetimes to stimulate this work. And so, you know, to me, it's emotional. 
this is the cancer in me and the band itself has a cancer son. It's, it's about love. Mm. It's about the reunion of love. That's never really ever lost. It just appears that way. And that's really what the book's about. Wow. Thank you. That's amazing. Anything else you'd like to share? Well, then you have the minor threads. There's five of those. We don't have to get into all of that detail, but there's five minor threads as well that are fascinating um, and, and a little bit more secondary and not as represented. Whereas the major threads have like 30 to 40 songs. The minor ones between like eight and 11 songs in each of those minor threads around there. And they just give more secondary information and they're, they're pretty fascinating. Um, to also track those. Hmm. Uh, so that's the way when the reader goes through the book, I, I talk about in the introduction is imagine all of Beatles songs being like this elaborate forest or woods and the threads are the trail markers. This is how we're going to navigate through this hmm. big catalog of 200 songs is we're going to follow these threads. Fascinating. Yeah, and yes. we'll just tease them that there are minor threads and give them one more reason to get the book so they can find out what they are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sweet. Anything else you want to share with our viewers and listeners before we wrap it up here? Um, I don't think so. Um, you know, I was just open to whatever questions you had. Um, I could talk about it endlessly. Um, <laughs> It was an honor and a privilege to, to write it and to be that absorbed in the process. And it came out a couple months ago and, and I needed a couple months to reorient back to myself and I mm -hmm. did. And now I'm starting to uh, talk about it more and promote it more. And I am available uh, for other uh, dialogues or um, media things. Um, you know, I've had reluctance around around this piece of it, but um, I'm now um, more uh, willing and interested in, in doing that. Uh, it was kind of an overwhelming, uh, all encompassing process that I was in to uh, to get the the detail and depth. I was immersed in it, mm. and um, and I needed to kind of get back to myself after the book came out. And now I have, and now I'm, I'm having fun with it again. Um, because completing a book that's almost 500 pages is an enormous ordeal. I mean, it's like, I, 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 the analogy I've used is climbing a mountain. Yeah. When you get to the peak of the mountain, you're exhausted. And it's, it's, it's hard to complete it with all the editing and all the detail. But now I'm, I'm, I'm getting a second wind and I'm, I'm eager to talk about it. So thank you for having me. Oh, my and pleasure fascinating stuff and i hope more people can can uh can get tuned on to it because it's 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 not only mind-blowing but it's heartwarming too yeah let me compliment you not only on the amazing content but the editing i mean it's it's very clean i don't think i spotted a, a single typo which is really unusual in a self-published book so kudos to you on the really professional copywriting and proofreading and all the behind the scenes stuff the most that's reading. why it took so long yeah is that the book took four and a half years hmm. because the editing and you know sue hilliard is was the main editor i worked with somebody else before her um but sue was the main editor and kudos to her for going over the material so many times um and that's why it took so long because it's 170 something thousand words hmm. and so it's it's a lot of combing through it and I'm not a real Virgo type. I'm more of a, a visionary thinker type. So putting on the Virgo hat and editing it like four times mm. was painstaking. It was a labor of love to, to yeah. do that. So that's why when I finished it, I'm like, okay, I need a break. Yeah. And I spent, I spent at least 70 hours just doing the end notes. Whoa. Wow. Thank you for putting that. And I'll assure the folks, you know, they're, if they're at all interested in astrology and or the Beatles, this book is well worth your time. It's, you know, it took me several weeks to read it because it, there's so much in it and there's so much depth, but um, I learned a lot reading it. I'm curious as when you wrote it, did you find that you gained any 
I mean, you've been a professional astrologer for a long time, so I know your your knowledge base is really solid already. Was there any significant new insights you gained as you wrote this book about astrology? Yes, actually, there is. There's a few things. Um, we talked about composite charts. I've been using composite charts my whole astrological life, mm -hmm. but I haven't used group composite charts that much composed mm. of more than two people. Ah. And, and the four of them with their group composite chart and seeing how accurate that is, like we talked about before, mm -hmm. not only in and of itself, but with the transits, is that now I'm looking at group astral, uh, composite charts more so. That was one thing that emerged for me. Um, another thing that I learned um, is the importance of Ceres, which became so important in this analysis, um, is that early developmental attachment issues is generally not the way most astrologers or most other people tend to view the world. Mm. Um, we don't think about early childhood attachment issues as the go-to way to understand things. But this project and how much Sarah's emerged has really deepened. I mean, I've got two degrees in psychology and I'm not a stranger to looking at things from this lens, but in my own life and my own studies, it really is the underlying motivation for a lot of who we are is attachment stuff. Mm. And Ferris and the moon have a lot to do with our psychology, our motivation, our woundedness, what, why we are the way we are, has a lot of roots to our human vulnerability and basic issues of love and care. And the Beatles, all you need is love you know, is their primary message, is accepting our humanness. And they have a cancer uh, composite son, and they've got a, a really substantial relationship with Ceres as seen in their, in their history and what unfolded. And so that signature came out as more dominant. Some people believe that Ceres should be considered one of the major planets. I know Kelly did. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, this project would not uh, conflict with that notion. <laughs> but I don't want to promote that at the exclusion of the other three or even other asteroids. It's just another part of the human condition. One that I, which, um, that I, I sense is underplayed hmm. and, um, and it's easily ignored, but it drives us um, unconsciously. Hmm. So to me, it's part of the awakening process is early developmental attachment. To me, awakening isn't about going into loftier, you know, ungrounded consciousness and, and the whole flight into light. To me, it's about deepening into our emotional human reality and having the deepest anchor in the self to secure our foundation on the earth and then open up and bring it down. Mm. We're not going anywhere. We're not escaping. You know, this is the common you know, misperception or misunderstanding when people talk about awakening is that everyone's trying to leave and get out of here mm. and not be in your body and not be incarnated. No, the point of the book is awakening and embodiment equally, mm -hmm. rising up and coming down. It's breathing in and out. And so that's really what the book is about. It's not about awakening. It's about awakening and embodiment. Mm. So, um, so to be more connected to the body, to the emotions, to our inherent humanness secures the spiritual reach that we can have um, with other dimensions or perspectives or experiences. So I want to give ample voice to that because so unfortunate out there is that anyone talking about awakening is seen as this ungrounded flight into light kind of person. And that's unfortunate and that's inaccurate. Yeah. Well, as anyone who follows me knows, I almost never say the word awakening without the word embodied in front of it. So <laughs> I'm totally on board with you on that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a necessary thing to, um, to keep on mentioning this because it's so often distorted. Yeah.
I've never heard the phrase flight into light before. That's really well spoken. Thank you. <laughs> I've heard that quite a bit. <laughs> or, or the spiritual bypass. Yeah, you know? that I've heard a lot. But flight into light is cool. I like that phrase. Yeah, but for me personally, you know, Pluto is just as relevant as Neptune. I've got two degrees in psychology. And my focus in this book, the Beatles book, and my other work is not uh, an invasion of the psychological and shadow. That is my background and my focus. Hmm. Yeah, my own metaphor for awakening is the great onion, where the, the awakens at the core, but you you do the shadow work and peel those layers off so the light can get brighter and brighter in your embodied experience. So yeah, I think yeah. I feel like we're coming from a similar idea. That's yeah, so I use the analogy of the onion as well. Yeah, yeah cool. Many layers to that. Yeah, cool. Well, anything else you want to get out here before we wrap? Um, No, I think that captures it. I think we, we mentioned plenty of things here. Um, so thank you for having me, Benjamin, and oh. for your great questions and your interest and your support. My pleasure. So if someone wanted to work with you as a client or any other way, how would they get in touch with you? Yeah, and they can always email me, eric at soulvisionconsulting.com. Um, Soul Vision Consulting is my website. Okay. Um, and so anyone can reach out, you know, um, my info is public. So um, I'm available. I, I love... Um, doing astrology counseling um it really is my favorite thing oh uh, sweet yeah and of course that's s-o-u-l vision counseling.com right okay cool no consulting s-o-u-l oh. soul vision consulting oh thank you for correcting me i'm sorry i was so focused on the soul i forgot the last word sorry <laughs> okay thank you eric it's been a real privilege to to interview you again and I hope that this helps lots of people discover you and your amazing book. And, and if you all love the Beatles book, then, you know, Eric's prior books, again, there's six of them that dive into astrology more specifically. They're also amazing. And I loved each and every one of them. So feel free to dive into those too, if you love his Beatles book. Thank you, Benjamin. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you so much, Eric. It's been a real privilege. Absolutely. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.